Hi guys and welcome back to my channel. The case that I'm going to look into today follows the serial killer Daniel Siebert who claimed to have killed 12 people between the years of 1979 and 1986. This was a suggested case by Ian so thank you for that, I appreciate any suggestions you guys have and of course if you have any more let me know. Daniel Lee Seibert was born on the 17th of June in 1954 in Mattoon, Illinois. Not much is really known about his childhood, but what we do know is that when he got to the age of 18, he decided that he wanted to join the Navy, which he did. He used a false name to do so. I don't know why, but he did. He used the name Daniel Marlowe, and that was in 1972. He served for three years before he was dishonorably discharged in 1975. Daniel would go on to commit his first murder in Las Vegas, Nevada, and he was actually caught for it pretty much straight away. He wasn't a very good at hiding his tracks, I guess. Now, I don't know the entirety of the plea the circumstances surrounding it, but he ended up taking a plea deal. And as a result of that plea deal, he only ended up serving a couple of years in jail for manslaughter rather than murder. Unfortunately though, that wasn't really a good idea to give him a plea deal at the time, you don't know, but it really wasn't because he would go on to strike again. And that is just frustrating to say the least. Obviously, he has killed someone. He is a sick guy and as horrible as it sounds, he enjoyed it and he didn't really get much in the way of punishment for it a couple of years in jail and so he figured that he wanted to do it again. He wanted to get that enjoyment again and that is what he did. By 1985, his parole was over and done with so he decided to up sticks and move to Los Angeles. Whilst he was there, he assault sexually assaulted and killed two more women. He was caught pretty much straight away again they issued out warrants for his arrest, they knew who had done it, and he was going to be officially charged with these murders. The problem was, by the time that they had actually issued these warrants, he was gone. He literally skipped town again and he was gone. He, even, he ended up moving to the East Coast and eventually settled in Saladegra in Alabama in 1986. Whilst in Alabama, he decided that he was going to use the Alabama Institute for the Deaf and the Blind as like his hunting ground, his way to choose his next victims, which is just so awful. Alabama is apparently really well known for this school and he was going to utilise that to commit his crimes against people that are disabled, you know, blind people, people that can't see it coming, which is just, it's just so awful. I mean, it's awful to target anyone, but he was targeting very vulnerable people and it's just, it's just tragic. He was thinking along the lines that if he chose women that could barely see or that were blind, that they would just be his perfect victim. After being there for just two weeks, one of the women that actually went to the school had not been in classes for an entire week. Her name was Sherry Webbers and they were worried about her because she hadn't rang in, she hadn't told them why she wasn't in school and it was out of character for her. Like normally if she was poorly or something she'd ring in and she just hadn't, they hadn't heard anything from her. So they were worried. In the end, the school counselor ended up calling the manager of her apartment block that she was living in. And they asked for them to complete a welfare check on Sherry. So off goes the manager, they knock on Sherry's door and receive no response. So they let themselves in and what they find is a horrific scene. And one that the manager really, really wouldn't have expected to see, to be honest. On Sherry's bed, under a sheet, they find Sherry's dead body along with her two sons' bodies, Chad and Joseph. They had all been murdered, Sherry had been strangled to death by all accounts, and she was naked. Of course, the manager calls the police straight away, but he also calls back the counsellor because this counsellor was worried for her safety and he wants to let, you know, them know that he was right, Sherry was not okay. And this was when the manager is then informed of another woman, who lives in that very same apartment block who has also not turned up to classes for an entire week. Once more, with no explanation. Her name was Linda Jarman. So once more, the manager goes to Linda's door, knocks on, receives no response. I presume 
this is my presumption that the manager thought that it wouldn't strike twice and that you know Linda just wasn't in or that she would be okay you wouldn't really assume that after finding such a horrific horrific sight that you would then come across another but they did they go in they find the naked body of Linda laid on a bed deceased this time she was not there was no attempt made to cover her up she had also been strangled to death I mean, can you imagine being that manager and literally finding four dead bodies all on the same day within a short space of time? How horrific that must have been and how scarring that must have been. Again, you would probably think that it, it wouldn't happen again and it did and it's just how horrific. So police began their investigation and pretty quickly there were some spe- suspicions around this new teacher, this new art teacher that had started at the school not so long ago. This teacher had openly, like, expressed his desire to be in a romantic relationship with Sherry Weathers. And so that pretty much made him suspect number one straight away. His name was Daniel Spence. And I know what you're thinking, that's not our guy. Well, after analysing fingerprints found at the scene, they found that it actually matched a former inmate called Daniel Cyber, who had also had these warrants for murder. So it did come out later that Daniel Spence and Daniel Cyber were the same man, like he had used a false name once more. Well, a false second name at least, he did stick with the name Daniel, I guess he really liked that name. Once more, they couldn't find him, but they dug deeper into the ongoings you know, recently, and they found that he had actually gone to the the school a couple of weeks prior to the incident and had offered to teach for free in the hopes of gaining a full-time job there, like somewhere down the road, and it was all a ruse, it was all just so that he could select his victims. Whilst looking into him, they actually found that he was supposed to be dating this woman. She was called Linda O'Dum and she was a waitress, and of course, they were really worried for her because they literally found these two women dead in this apartment block and he had killed them and so he's dating a woman so what makes him not what makes her life not under threat kind of thing so they were really worried about her they began looking for her and when they go to her family they found out that they had actually reported her missing and she had been missing reported missing since the february linda's body wouldn't actually be found for a few weeks until the march Hunters actually stumbled across her naked dead body laid out in the Talladega forest. She had also been strangled. It kind of looked like he'd put her out there so that she would never be found, but luckily she was found. His fingerprints were also found in her stolen car, so that tied him into the case too. The police knew that Daniel Siebert was the killer. They knew exactly who he was and they spread the word that that's the man they were looking for. And literally everybody was looking for this serial killer. He actually spent the next six months on the run before he was eventually caught in Hurricane Mills in Tennessee. The reason why he was caught, you may ask, well, he rang up this friend, probably asking for help or something. I don't know the ins and outs of that, but this friend did the right thing and reported him to the police. The next call he made was then traced to this phone booth, which was near this restaurant, and they arrested him the following day as he showed up for work. He was working at that restaurant. Daniel was then extradited back to Talladega and not long after that, two additional bodies were found and his fingerprints once more were found all over the crime scene. The strangulation of Cheryl Evans in a remote area in Alabama, Calhoun County. Then another murder which took place in Atlantic City, New Jersey, a woman named Beatrice McDougall. Beatrix actually works at a hotel and was apparently showing Daniel this room and that is when he killed her. He strangled her to get to death. Whilst he was in custody, years later, Daniel actually admitted to 12 or more murders, but he would never actually go on trial for those murders. He later admitted to killing both of the women whose bodies were found later and in 1986 was charged with the murder of Beatrice McDougall. Then in 1987, he was charged with the murder of Sherry Weathers and her children, Linda Jarman and Linda. He was found guilty of all of the murders and he was sentenced to death. So from 1987 up until 2008, Daniel sat on death row. He was awaiting for his execution to be carried out, which was scheduled for the 25th of October in 2007. During this time, he'd actually been undergoing treatment for pancreatic cancer and the entire time he was trying to appeal his sentence. 
His appeals did not work and his lawyers decided that they were going to instead sue the state of Alabama under the claims that the Alabama capital punishment of death by lethal injection was unconstitutional. That basically resulted in all executions by lethal injection in Alabama being halted and I believe it was like that for over a year until they sorted everything out. His execution was literally delayed hours before it was supposed to happen. And meanwhile, Daniel's in jail, he's making all of this artwork and selling it and he's earning, you know, a decent amount of money from it. He's just enjoying his jail time, I guess. On the 22nd of April in 2008, Daniel Lee Cyber actually passed away in Holman Prison due to complications from his pancreatic cancer. His death sentence by the state was never carried out. The funny thing was though, literally one week after he passed away, the US Supreme Court finally ruled in favour of using the lethal injection as a capital punishment in Alabama and all of the executions were reinstated. They wanted to do them as quick as because obviously there had been so many delays and guess who was number one at, of that list? Daniel. He was at the very top of the list. He was going to get executed first so he would have been put to death just one week later. So literally within one or two weeks after he had died due to cancer, his sentence was going to get carried out but it just never happened because he'd already passed away. Again, he did claim that he killed 12 people but he wasn't convicted for all of those. He said that he knew some of the victims and he, names and he told the police those names and they were murders that had never even been con connected to him like whatsoever before that. He was never tried for any more murders and I believe it was due to his execution like he should have been tried for them in my eyes either way but he never was and then in the end he died due to cancer anyway. But yeah that is the end of this case. I did find it interesting and honestly he wasn't the brightest light bulb I guess like he literally got caught every time he murdered someone but the annoying thing was he either got a lax sentence as a result of it or just skipped town and then seemingly just got away with it for so many years and ended so many more lives because he was out there roaming free and he was just not caught even though they knew he was their man and that is so frustrating because if they would have caught him sooner then they could have spared some innocent lives. There's just a whole lot of tragic loss of life in this case. But yeah, that is the end of the case. If you guys have enjoyed this video, please give me a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you want to join the pack and you're new here. To all my regulars, I appreciate you. Anyway guys, that's all I have today on the case of Daniel Lee Siebert. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, bye.